And our webinar today is Inspiring Literature Students to Become Lifelong Readers. And we are very honored today to have Michael Meyer and Dagoberto Gill with us today. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over some of the basic webinar procedures. Um, you may have noticed that we've muted your phones upon entry. That's just so we can avoid any background noise because we will be recording this session so that um, other colleagues can, can hear this later. But uh, just because you're muted doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. We will have plenty of time for questions and answers um, immediately following the presentation. And um, you can use the chat function to, to uh, let us know your thoughts and questions. If you can't see the chat on the right-hand side of the page, just click on the chat tab at the very top of the page, and the chat window will open up for you. So now, without um, further ado, we'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Um, Michael Meyer, of course, is an experienced teacher and highly regarded literary scholar. He taught writing and literature courses for more than 30 years, from 1981 to 2010, at the University of Connecticut, and before that, at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte and the College of William & Mary. His scholarly articles have appeared in distinguished journals, such as American Literature, Studies in the American Renaissance, and Virginia Quarterly Review. He is an internationally recognized authority on Henry David Thoreau, a former president of the Thoreau Society, and co-author of the New Thoreau Handbook, a standard reference source. His first book, Several More Lives to Live, Thoreau's Political Reputation in America, was awarded the Ralph Henry Gabriel Prize by the American Studies Association. His books for Bedford St. Martins include The Bedford Introduction to Literature, The Compact Bedford Introduction to Literature, Literature to Go, and Poetry and Introduction. And of course, Dagoberto Guild is an esteemed fiction writer and currently writer in residence and executive director of Centro Victoria, the Center for Mexican American Literature and Culture at the University of Houston, Victoria. Born in Los Angeles, Gilb worked as a construction worker and a journeyman high-rise carpenter for about 16 years as he began writing his fiction. In 1993, his first full collection, the critically acclaimed book, The Magic of Blood, won the Penn Ernest Hemingway Award, as well as the Jesse Jones Award from the Texas Institute of Letters, and was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award. On the heels of the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, he published a novel, The Last End Residence of Mickey Acuna, which was followed by a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. Published in 2003, Gritos, consisting of previously published essays in such venues as The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, and The Nation, along with commentaries written for National Public Radio's Fresh Air, offers a perspective on how a Mexican-American working man became a nationally recognized working writer. Another novel, The Flowers, and two more collections of stories, Woodcuts of Women and 2011's Before the End, After the Beginning, have solidified his reputation as a highly regarded fiction writer. Furthering his goal of making Mexican Americans apparent in American culture, in 2011, he founded Wisachi, the magazine of Latino literature, published by Centro Victoria at the University of Houston, Victoria. Featuring literary works from mostly Latino writers who are largely neglected or ignored, the magazine also opens its pages to all fiction, poetry, and essays that challenge ethnic, gender, or social stereotyping. So we are very pleased to welcome today um, Michael Meyer and Dagoberto Guild. Hello, gentlemen. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. I Great. Do. I can you hear Michael? Can you hear us? <laughs> We certainly we sure can. Me? We're very delighted to have you. Yes, Good. Dagoberto, we hear you loud and clear. That's great. I know Dagoberto is calling okay. in from Austin. Is that right? I am in Austin. In Austin, okay. And Michael, you are in Connecticut? Right, in, at the university. Mm -hmm. Great, wonderful. Okay, great. Um, well, this will be a question and answer type style webinar. So we will um, start with kind of uh, the first question, very first broad question. And uh, we thought this would be certainly of interest to lots of folks on the phone um, because just the nature of, of literature courses today and the introductory course um, in, in particular, in some parts of the country, of course, the introductory literature course has been diminished or is no longer required. So in your view, um, we wanted to get your thoughts on why should students study literature? And Michael, we'll, we'll start with you on that one. Well, I suppose I could say that it's good for them, which I think it is. <laughs> But actually, I think that uh, I I, th I think they should study it because and read it perhaps is more to the point uh, for the same reasons that I've spent my life teaching it. Um, I teach literature pretty much for the same reason I read it, and that is for pleasure. 
I think I think reading imaginative literature makes us more aware of life's possibilities as well as its subtleties and ambiguities. And uh, put simply, it makes me more than I would be otherwise. And I think it does the same for my students. Um, there's even a, a scientific study published this month from the New School that offers hard evidence, uh, confirming the obvious, by the way, uh, that reading good literature can make one more empathetic and a better person. Uh, I guess that's a good thing, um, even if there are, of course, plenty of crooks and murderers who have read the classics. So it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. make you a better person. Uh, but on a practical level, uh, the interpretation of literature requires us to deal with uncertainties, with value judgments, ideas, emotions, um, all kinds of things. Um, and that sort of critical thinking equips us to understand better, I think, uh, unavoidable dimensions of our own lives, both on private and public levels. Um, I'm hooked on it and have been my whole life, really. Um, and so are my, my students, the ones who continue to read, I think, uh, because it, it, it allows you to, to laugh, uh, to cry, to, to, to dream, to shriek, to rage, to, to do all kinds of things with characters by simply turning a page rather than turning your life upside down. Um, it's a way of, of extending our lives, our experiences. And I especially like to teach the course because for so many students, it may be the only literature course they ever take. And that's a, that's a serious responsibility, I think. And that's becoming increasingly true regardless of whether or not they're enrolled in a two-year college or a university. And if they do choose to take another literature course, I feel pretty good about that. Uh, I still get a kick out of um, dealing with first-year students who are fresh and relatively new to it and whose pleasure becomes very apparent fairly soon. It's fun. Yeah, that's great. That, that's great. Yeah, and um, Doug Aberto, what are your thoughts on, on students studying literature and, and kind of why they should study literature? Well, first of all, thank you for doing this. Um, going off what Michael had just said about um, the health that literature brings, I, I guess I do, I, I kind of go with that, you know, I, I, I want to say that the brain, I think, is a muscle and has to be used. And, and the best thing about lit is that unlike, you know, the elliptical machine or the step machine or the ab machine, um, what might be in the earbuds is background in, in an app or an iPod. Uh, the, the background of lit is 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 the workout is the foreground, and it 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 is healthy. It makes you strong, and and I, I think what what I mean by strong, and here I go in my my typical, I get goofy. You'll have to forgive me for being goofy. I can't <laughs> I can't help myself, but but uh, I, I guess I think that a that. The easiest way to see lit is that that not 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 studying lit is like letting a city boy never see Glacier National Park, or or a country girl has never been high in a building, sort of looking down at a stream of human busyness and a and accomplishment, and never got to think that maybe she should, maybe she can. But uh, the other way to do it, you know, and I guess I. I think uh, a lot of people are young and thinking about this, and and they'll think about this a lot more as they get older. But I want to I want to suggest that how can anyone fall in love if they've never read a poem? But even more, and I think our more adult <laughs> ones will know this better. But how can anyone get over a bad love if they've never read a story? You know, the only last thing I say about that is. Just beware of those who say they are that are in love and have only read verses that make a sale. Uh, that's <laughs> what literature's for. That's right. That's great. Those are those are excellent points. I, I'm sure everyone on this call, you know, has certainly has a philosophy on why students should study literature. But it's, it's always interesting <laughs> to hear even more reasons because we, we know there are so many reasons. Uh, so so that's that's wonderful. Um, also, of course, uh, you know, aside from the institutional pressures that um, that I'm sure a lot of a lot of folks on the call may face, um, uh, Michael, I'm wondering if you can just briefly discuss some of the instructor challenges um, in teaching literature today, um, and how have you tried to address some of these challenges in your anthologies? Sure. Uh, I, I suppose I I should say I'm I'm 
thinking about this in the context that the English department has budget has just been cut yet again. Um, and one of the big cuts appears in um, freshman English. Um, so I, I, I'm aware that uh, there are many schools out there, many departments out there that are facing uh, really serious challenges that uh, in some ways are perhaps unprecedented um, in, in terms of the recent past at any rate. Um, and unfortunately, many of our students aren't reading imaginative literature as much as they once did. Uh, and the question is, what, what can we do about that decline? Uh, the contemporary electronic cultural context in which we teach is increasingly, I think, problematic and, and challenging because <coughs> Americans seem to be lead, reading less, at least on the page. Maybe they're reading snippets here and there more on screens, but probably less on the page. And there are plenty of government reports to attest to that. And there's also a kind of uh, uh, sensibility that one has to, I think, uh, confront, and, and that is that um, uh, literature, people don't talk about literature as much as, as they used to, as, as they're not reading it as much. And even, even uh, real estate agents have advised sellers, I've heard this on BBC World News, uh, real estate agents have advised uh, sellers to get rid of books when they, quote, stage their house for showing because they make a room look, to use their language, quote, tired in middle age. Now, of course, the BBC <laughs> News uh, <laughs> thought this was appalling, but uh, it is an interesting kind of sidebar. Um, I don't think anyone is surprised that television, film, the Internet, and other electronic media have affected the number of literary readers in America, or the world for that matter. But the rate of that cultural change is remarkable, and its effect on college students, I think, is astounding. Um, many of our current and former students simply exempt themselves from literary reading. Um, what do we do about that devaluation? I think it creates uh, a, a lot of responsibility for us as we teach. And certainly the demands placed upon introductory literature courses these days are enormous. Uh, for all of you out there who are teaching this course, and I assume all of you are probably, uh, this is no surprise to you, and it's no secret that there are administrative requirements that must be met to justify such courses in an expanding competitive curriculum in which the humanities, unfortunately, are increasingly marginalized. Consider, for example, how introductory classes are freighted with learning outcomes of the sort that make their way into departmental rationales for the course. Uh, we teach critical reading and thinking, writing about fiction, uh, poetry, and drama. We teach the writing process, including invention, revision, and editing. We teach literary terminology along with basic critical theory. We teach library skills coupled with research and documentation techniques. And of course, we also sensitize students to issues related to ethnicity, multiculturalism, regionalism, and global awareness. It's sort of the Swiss army knife of the humanities curriculum. These are all, of course, admirable goals, but what we currently demand of introductory literature classes would no doubt meet the strict requirements of the spirit of somebody like Cotton Mather, who insisted that literature, and everything else for that matter, be utilitarian, didactic, and pragmatic. And that is to say, it finally has to be useful. Uh, now, sometimes I wonder if we would soon be also required to repair small appliances in the course as well. Uh, the list seems to grow every day. I have nothing against being useful, uh, though it might be instructive to compare course descriptions of introductory literature courses with comparable music or art classes. Um, but there does seem to be a kind of tyranny of the useful in these course descriptions in their exclusion of terms such as pleasure, joy, and the imagination. Only rarely, and I, I'm really very rarely, have I ever read justifications for literature courses that emphasize enjoyment and pleasure, the sheer pleasure of play as an important outcome. And that's what I believe creates lifelong readers, and that's what informs my table of contents. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I do, I do think that, that we miss the boat to some degree. Uh, and in fact, we may sink it. If, uh, if we don't emphasize pleasure and play and imagination. Yeah, that's a, a very, very good point there. Um, um, and Doug Alberto, um, uh, just kind of addressing it maybe from the student perspective as well, um, you know, obviously we know instructors have challenges teaching this course. You know, how, how would you kind of characterize some of the students' uh, challenges in taking a literature course and perhaps based on some of your, your experiences even as a student? 
Yeah, I, I loved what Michael had to say both about the the fixing the appliance aspect and then, and also the <laughs> the pleasure. I I actually think that 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 literature and fiction in particular that's what I know best um do both. But what's interesting for me is that you know, I am the the student that you're that the teachers that are listening to this are I am one of those students. I, I came up that way. I I did not come into a to a lit class. I, I frankly am a, as surprising as it might seem because I'm so articulate and brilliant sounding. I was a terrible <laughs> English and, and particularly bad in, in English in high school. I I did not do well, but I did do well enough to go to to community colleges. Junior colleges were were you know all over me. They were, they wanted me, and uh, but. I came into a class like this not knowing, you know, completely naive to what literature was, what I had no idea um, what it was for or what it did, which is to say that I am like the students that read this book probably a lot. You know, I struggled in English, and I knew little about why I was in college, except for that vague, that vague awareness, that need to learn, the, that want of learning. Um, the only stories I'd ever that I really paid attention to, like everybody, were 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 pot boilers uh, or sitcoms from TV, all gimmicked out, and you know the end. And most of the story itself would be forgotten in 60 seconds. But this is what happened to me, and I think it ha- would happen to most students that once once they read a real story, and you know, I I'm you know accidentally been a become a lit teacher in and once they see what a real story is like Young Goodman Brown, things change. They get it, and they know why literature is not what they thought it was. That they they know that stories aren't just a, you know there's not just the lollipop that they're getting from a, a good story, and you know, and, and you know, as far as the wideness, you know, the largeness of what an anthology does, I have to say that I, you know, I'm, it sounds funny to say that I, I'm the perfect choice, <laughs> but I, I think I it was a good choice because I think, you know, I, I'm recognizable. My life and my stories are recognizable to the students that are going to be reading this. I, I am probably most of their dads. I'm a construction worker who didn't who didn't come from nobody in my family. They they questioned my my Americanism to go to college. Like, what are you studying? They knew that something was going wrong that I was screwing up my life. But but once I uh, you know studied lit and got to know, and when you read anthology, you realize that that stories and poems are like us. They're tall and they're short. They're fat, they're flat over their skin, and they talk in all kinds of languages. And but but that's what lit did to me. And and I think I I think you will find that a lot of students, if if uh, they read good things, that's what's going to happen. It, what I going back in my my last thing, it's it's like a, the first kiss. You kind of realize, oh, there might be something in this. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you, Do you remember what what particular stories kind of uh, uh, all of a sudden the light bulb went on for you? Oh my God! I, I, I you know, <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the spot. Was, I was just curious. Yeah, no. I mean, it is hard to think of think of them, but I have to I have to say that my first love affair was with Dostoevsky. Um, you wow. know, and uh, I just realized that I wanted to know what the heck was going on in the world. I, I can think more <laughs> the life of Ivan Illich. I remember reading that and thinking, "Oh my God, a story is you know there's more than just the plot." And I think that was the big discovery for me that that when you read fiction, even poetry, there was more than just what you read, that other layer underneath it that mattered. And suddenly, when I realized there was something more to it, more depth, you know, I was challenged, and I wanted to do it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. That's great. Um, so, um, Michael, so um, a question for you here too. Um, you know, how can we get? How can instructors get their students to engage? You know, more deeply with with reading. Um, you know. Also, you know, in this in your latest anthologies, the in-depth chapter with Dagoberto Guild or a particular author, um, you know, can they serve that kind of need? That, that's you know perhaps one way. But but how can instructors get the students to engage more deeply? Well, I think first of all, they need to be deeply engaged themselves, um, mm -hmm. and and I think that's generally true. Uh, I, people teach literature because they like love to read it, but I, I think it's important to remember why you. You like it in the first place, and and in terms of my teaching and, and what I've included in the in my textbooks is that I've and I think it's it maybe pretty good advice for instructors is that I, I try never to forget what I didn't know as a student, and there was a lot I didn't know. Um, I think instructors take quite a lot for granted, and and in terms of sensitizing students and 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 having practice reading. Um, that that remembering that walking through a passage specifically and work and working out a poem, uh, you know, in detail, is an important activity. And like anyone else, students want to be engaged and interested in what they read. And so the, the reading list is crucially important. I don't think it can be simply perfunctory or what happens to be available. Um, and like anyone else, uh, students respond to a passionate encounter. Uh, I think if I think we have to remember that if we're going to have them be become lifelong readers. We, we need to make sure that students don't mistakenly associate literature more with examinations than with their own lives. Because if they do, then when they graduate, they'll surely leave behind literary reading as they wave goodbye to us. Um, I'm told, by the way, that uh, in New York State, uh, blue books are made in the state prisons, um, which I found interesting. <laughs> in, in, in my work as an anthologist and text recorder, I, I found that a healthy dose of, in terms of specific things that I think we can do, uh, that a healthy dose of contemporary works helps students in introductory courses to find their way into literature by enhancing your appreciation and understanding of it. And I want to emphasize, again, that I'm, I'm talking only about introductory courses. I don't pander to ahistorical deficiencies. I teach American literature courses that are, uh, that are very much bound to periods. But I do believe that it's worth keeping in mind that we're teaching many students who were very likely born around 1995 and who hardly ever take a course that actually manages to, to catch up to their own moment. Um, and, and again, please don't get me wrong, um, much of my own course, and certainly the book, uh, consists of canonical and period works with writers ranging from Sophocles and Shakespeare and Dunn and Dickinson and Rossetti and Whitman and Hawthorne and so on. Um, and throughout, I, I try to integrate contemporary writers so that students fully comprehend that literature is a living art that doesn't necessarily require annotations, footnotes, and specialized sensibilities. I think that's the kiss of death, actually. Um, and for me, a, a visit to the refurbished Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan confirmed this approach. If you've been there lately, you know that uh, you now enter the museum exhibit space through a 100-foot atrium that features contemporary art up through last Tuesday, uh, from which visitors then branch off into other galleries to see how the history of art developed over time. The point and the strategy there, uh, and it's one that I think is uh, useful for us, the point and strategy is to emphasize that art is alive and worthy of immediate attention, not just some kind of uh, retrospective sniff that is not just for historians of one sort or another. And literary art can not only be contemporary and immediate, it can also, of course, be fun and, and even a hoot. Uh, but students and instructors, I think, frequently complain to me, I've heard it a lot over the course of working on this book for 30 years, complain that literature selections are too uniformly weighty and earnest in their treatment of subjects such as uh, tragic love and sudden death, war and peace, racism and societal ills. And all of that, of course, can be found in the book and as well as all kinds of other calamitous grievances and agonies that human beings suffer. But at the same time, I've included a hefty selection of humor and satire and fiction and poetry and drama in my course, uh, because I want to make a case for the idea that humor engenders thought as well as pleasure. And so I, I try to emphasize all that's messy and 
curious and surprising, the surprising pleasure, really, that there is in reading. And I think the case for that can often be most readily made with contemporary selections that, that deepen and enrich students' reading of canonical works. They're reflexive. They're not mutually exclusive. And it's not a bait-and-switch strategy. Instead, it's a double hook, an enticement that allows students to make thematic and stylistic connections that amplify and reinforce the kind of analytic skills necessary for informed, intelligent, critical reading and writing. But what I don't want us to forget mm -hmm. is the passion. We need to be engaged in it ourselves. Right, right, yes, very very good point. Um, and um, uh, lastly, um, Tagoberto, and, and this was a question for both of you, but uh, Tagoberto, if you can maybe address it first. Of course, the new um, Meyer anthologies do uh, include um, an in-depth chapter on, um, on Tagoberto, on your, your kind of your, your work and life. And um, I'm just curious about how you all collaborated um, on this in-depth chapter and um, you know, how you chose some of the photographs for that and, and, and that sort of a thing. Yeah, no, um, first, Go ahead. going back to Mike. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, please. The, the, what Michael just said, I, I now realize why he chose me for the, the comedy and messiness. I had no idea. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, I, I have to say that was quite, it was fun going through the chapter. I mean, obviously going looking back at your life and saying, oh, my God, I really was bad. I did that. That was something. And, uh, the commentary, uh, I thought the commentary sentences he used about to describe it were really good, but a little too brief. <laughs> I, I needed more <laughs> more compliments. Um, but but I did I did realize that it probably I, I reduced it to four items that that probably encouraged him to include me. The first was, and it's a big one, about work. You know, I spent 16 years, you know, as an adult in, um, working construction. And um, and I'll go back to that. But then the second one was the West. I, I really do myself notice quite a bit that the West, you know, it, it gets a little attention, but not quite the attention that you know, naturally the East does because they're smarter out there. <laughs> and then finally... <laughs> um, <laughs> the the Mexican American community, which you know, as we we all know, that even though there's a discussion of Latino population uh, demographic change, in fact that means probably 80 percent Mexican American because it's like 95 percent in the West it's is Mexican American and Latinos, and and then fourth the other thing I think you wanted work by me I don't know. I thought I, I knew he was considering other other pieces that weren't by me, but that was the other thing. But but going back about work, I think that's the strongest. You know, well, too, but the working class. I think that's something that, frankly, and especially now, isn't really dealt with or even much in fiction in these days. Uh, as a as a writer, I feel pretty much like a dinosaur fading out the last one thumping around the earth that that had you know a job in in a physical a physical job as an adult for as long I mean even for a year it's pretty much unheard of. Most writers now have just done everything in a perfect schooled way. Nothing wrong with that, but it I do think it it's nice, especially at a at an introductory level for students to read stories that they can see that, w that were in their own home. I, I'm sure that at least half the students that, that go to college are, are first-time students, first, first people in the family like, like me, and most of the students I see, they do not come from a, a family that went to college. They're all working class and, and, and jobs where you, you, people get dirty. The other one, of course, is the Mexican American culture, which is still highly exotic in this country and and far less exotic to the Mexican American student who is in the class and I think you know as a teacher over the years, I would find that when I would have you know in a in a class in Texas or 
something like in the West, I'd you know have a class of twenty and six, seven, eight would be Mexican Americans, and I think it would be the first time in their in their life that somebody in a position of, of authority was leading the class and discussing them in a way that didn't make them uncomfortable. And I, I, I think that's mm-hmm. an incredibly bright move. And aside from it being a bright move, it's it's actually the right thing. It's what what America looks like. And I, I'm really proud that I that I get to to represent that. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, very very good points. And, and Michael, I know you had some some comments too on the collaboration. And uh, yes, uh, yes. Well, I, I, yeah. I was I interrupted. I'll go back to it at the very beginning because I wanted to point out that it actually began over a drink at the Parma House in the bar in Chicago. <laughs> it's a good start. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, he, uh, we have we enjoy, I think we enjoy each other's company and and I think it comes through in the chapter. Um, he was very generous with the materials that he provided, and and he was absolutely right, of course, about the, the working voice that emerges uh, from the, the four short stories. There are three in the chapter, and then one that's outside that chapter in the book, and they really provide a, a different kind of perspective than a lot of writers do. And I've done two other chapters before with poets, um, in which uh, I provided biographical context, and they provided photographs and commentary about the works and um, uh, uh, ancillary materials that really humanized the chapters, made them alive, I think, to students. That was with Billy Collins and with Julia Alvarez. But what what Dagoberto really provides here is this uh, emphasis upon working class culture, physical labor, uh, voices that don't often get heard in in these kinds of books. And I I also, of course, liked his personal history uh, because uh, uh, so many writers come out of MFA programs. Not that there's anything wrong with that, uh, but they, there is a kind of similarity to a lot of prose and poetry written in America today because of those writing programs, the way things get workshopped. But that's another story. Uh, but obviously, that uh, the, 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 his writing comes out of his experience. And, and frankly, I, my father was a longshoreman. He was a dock worker. We did not sit around talking about the rhyme of the ancient manor at the dinner table. And I came out of that myself. And, I, and for a long time, I, real, I began to realize that those voices were not really represented in this anthology of 2,300 pages. There were some, but not a whole lot. And for that reason, too, I included a chapter, uh, a poetry chapter in this last edition on work and poetry. And some, there's some really uh, wonderful poets who write about that. But it's, but it's sort of underrepresented, I think. And the... Um, the, the stories here with the wonderful photographs of his family and, and Los Angeles and El Paso and, and drafts of manuscripts and galleys from the New Yorker and so on. And then there's an interview in which uh, we talk about everything from political correctness to advocacy embedded in fiction. All of that uh, sets up a, 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 a chapter that I, that I think really allows for his humanity as well as his writing to come through, and I, I think students need to be, need to be reminded that there that these stories and poems and plays are not written for anthologies; they're written by people for other readers, and that readers have access to them. I mean, they're, they're and they have access to the, their the writers' personalities and their lives and their interests, and that it can speak to their own, and that's important. Yeah, that's great. That's that's wonderful. Um, so at, at this time, what we'd like to do um, are take some questions from those of you on the phone. Um, uh, you can use the chat feature. Again, if you don't see the chat window, um, just go to the top of your page and click on the chat tab, and then you should see the chat window. If you can, if you can address your questions to all panelists, that way we don't miss any of your questions. Um, and Karen Henry, our Editor-in-Chief, will be um, also monitoring the chat. And Karen, I think, um, uh, there may have been some questions that come in earlier that you wanted to um, to start with. Uh, sure. Here's here's one that I think is going to be an easy one for Dagoberto. Uh, you've written so many great stories. Do you have a favorite? Wow. You call that easy? 
<laughs> um, that's like that's you know the the it's a cliche, but that's like asking me which of my children are the, is the is the cutest. Um, but but I, I will do this. It's, I mean, I, I it just depends. It just so happens that a, a poet friend of mine who I admire very much had just read a one of my stories and and she uh, she read it on a oh god I don't even know what the right word is but it's a she taped herself reading, and it was churchgoers, and and churchgoers is in my my first collection, which you know it's long enough, long enough in the past that you know I, oh well well that book what was the story again? Anyway, churchgoers is about a guy named Smooth and a and a and a and a, a foreman uh, named T oh God T I think his name is T O but I'm forgetting <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, it's a story about work and about about a very bad, unlikable employee getting a more unlikable super who fires people willfully and meanly and um, and cruelly. And finally, he fired the wrong guy and got he got the sh scared out of him. And and it was one of those hallelujah moments when you go, oh my God, there is justice in the world. And uh, yeah, no, I I forgot. I I was very proud of that story. I could go on about it, but I I'll leave it to the next question. I know that makes okay. us want to read it. Um, here's a question from Elizabeth Starr. I find that students just don't know how to set aside time to read due to the intrusions of texting, internet, phone, etc. Some want to read, but just can't concentrate enough to do it. Do either of you have any ideas, on, or anybody in the um, in the group to, to today, any ideas on what might work to help with this? Hmm. Um, well, I, I, obviously, if they're, in, they're they're students, and they should be making time to read. I guess I I don't I'm not quite sure how to. How, what to say to somebody who who feels that way? Except that, that uh, unless it goes beyond required reading, uh, maybe setting aside an hour. I mean, I find that I, I, I sleep a lot better if I read an hour before I go to sleep at night, and and it's always a pleasure. It's a, one of the favorite, my favorite parts of the day. Um, but I think it's a matter of whatever whatever the best time is for uh, whoever it is. Uh, it's a matter of simply setting aside the time and doing it. And it's like exercising. It's like making sure that you eat well. It's like paying attention to your partner or spouse or friend or whatever. I, it's, it, it requires some will, I suppose. But like anything else, the more habit-forming, that more, the more it's a habit, the more habit-forming it becomes, and then it becomes natural. And that's, that's the thing I, I think that I want most out of my courses with, with these students is that they see it as a source of pleasure, and that it become habit forming. That it that it be something that they uh, they steal they steal time from their jobs from their other courses in order to read. Uh, I I actually have a just a quick comment on that. I I often you know I think obviously all that's true, and, and these addictions to cell phones that's a a new human problem that we're going to have to face, but. I also want to point out, and I find it an obligation of the artists, the writers, to write good stuff. Yeah, yeah. That that's... isn't boring. I think a huge I... amount. I'll go to you know, high schools I've spoken, in, and you know, I know I was one of them. You would sit there and think, "This, I can't read this. I must be stupid." And the person sitting next to next to me, and the person sitting next to that person. They're going through the same thoughts, but if we ever just talked to each other and said, what do you think of this, this story? And, well, I couldn't read two paragraphs. And then you find when they read something good, and that's what happened to me, I read something good, and I said, oh, my God, there's something here. So I think it isn't quite a fault of the technology. If TV is better than – if TV stories are better than, than lit. I often want to tell my students that it, writing, you have to be better than TV writers, and most of you bore me. I'd rather watch a, a bad sitcom is better than your your so-called good story. So. Well, 
Great. We have a comment from Amy Erickson. I, maybe everybody can see it. She she says, I think it helps to introduce students to humorous literature. And, Michael, you mentioned that earlier. She mentions in particular Bill Bryson, Steve Russian, and Dave Eggers are wonderful examples. Yeah, um, sure. We have a different a, a different question um, from Lois Rubin, and I, I think it's to the two of you who teach, and, and again, to anyone who teaches, are you in favor of using activities like role play and creative responses, like write a different ending, as well as discussion in literature classes, as a way to engage students? Uh, yeah, I, I actually have some, some of the, the, uh, the questions that follow poetry and drama and fiction in the, uh, in the text ask students to come up with uh, another paragraph or an alternative ending. Um, I think that that can be useful. Um, I, 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 anything that anything that, I, that actually in, in, engages them further in, into the text and, and asks them to think about uh, how something is written and how it achieves its effects and why why that happens, I think is a, is a useful activity. Um, Dana Bullard uh, has an idea to go to go along with this with this trend. For my students in Mississippi, I had to begin slowly. They did not have the fluency or the attention span to begin. We began by reading ten minutes at a time, and then uh, she let them read what they found in the anthology, and they spread the word to each other about what they liked in that reading, which I think is a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I found you know when I when I teach freshman comp that when I'd I'd read to the read the students and interrupt and explain what I read the first you know the first story just to let them know that it isn't just the story that you're reading there's an undercurrent of story there's a question being asked and I I, I always found that helped. So yeah, but yeah, again, attention span is a lot about the story. Um, and here, here's mm -hmm. another a practical suggestion or question from Joyce Stover. Uh, do you think that restricting the size of the class could make a difference in the participation of students? It seems the larger the class, the less discussion of the essay, the story, the novel. What techniques do you use to encourage discussion in your classes? Well, I, I think it, it certainly can make a difference, and the chemistry of the class is uh, deeply affected by that. But um, I, I have to say that at the same time, I've had classes of honors classes of 14, and then gang classes of 120, where uh, discussions were uh, wonderful in both, and classes in which both bombed, uh, in which was a dead end. In which I wish I, uh, you know, I was uh, uh, working in an ice cream truck, doing anything else but but teaching that class. But uh, that happens. Um, certainly, large classes inhibit, to some degree, uh, the kind of intimacy and and the, the ability to sort of cross talk and, and and have a real conversation. But at the same time, a really engaging. And I've seen I've seen it. I've sat it in law classes that uh, are huge, uh, and I team taught a business class in literature with nearly 200 students once that was, I have to say, pretty damn lively. Um, I, it, it's all a matter of, of asking the right kinds of questions and, and, and pressing yourself into it. I mean, when you're, if you're teaching a large class, get out from behind the lectern and walk down the aisles. If you're teaching a small class, put them in a circle. Um, it, it, it's, it's easy, to, you know, for, for that, just for those physical kinds of things. But but mostly it's 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 being really over prepared and and engaged and passionate in what you're doing, knowing the text cold, so that you can you can you can refer to it without having to fumble uh, through pages and so on, and keeping keeping the discussion going. Great, that's great. I just asked if anybody else who's listening has um, some suggestions. For engaging their students, I'm sure you know you, you've all tried various things. So feel free to, to you know help each other. Hearing, yeah. Um, another another question that that comes up is, and you've been sort of both of you have been addressing it. Have you had the experience of having students you know read a piece of literature that really has changed uh, their life? 
because that's again, I think you, you've been kind of addressing that. That's what you really need to be able to to see as a student that literature can change something about your life. I, I have, and it's what I I found. I had no expectation or awareness that this would happen to me. I came into even college teaching sort of incidentally, not willfully or intentionally. Um, but I have seen students dramatically change their life. Now, I do not think, I think you have to, and I'm sure that all you teachers out there know this much better than me, but in a class of 20, 15 to 20, you're not going to get them all. And I don't think you should even, you know, shouldn't beat yourself up because uh, you only get five. But I think even though you're dealing with those, you know, you're talking to the five and the next ten, and then there's a the five that they're just not ready, but they're in the class. You just hope you can maintain them. But the five that are going to change, you can see it. You can see it in their eyes. I was one of them. I, I, I absolutely get a, a real great pleasure when I see, you know, a student that came in that class and suddenly they're, they're in college. They get it. I mean, the joy of being in college, the excitement of, of opening a, a new world. I was that student, and I have had many. I'm still in touch with them. I've seen them go on. I mean, we're not, these are not children, you know, young adults who uh, came to college thinking they knew what they were going to do and what family that gave them any advice. But, yeah, a good story and, and a good class can change a life, and it's, you know, that is is the biggest pleasure I've gotten as a teacher. I'm, I'm, I love it. Yeah, I've, I've certainly, over the course of my career, run into that uh, quite a lot, and, and it is uh, it is remarkable when it happens. I, I think of actually quite a few instances, but two that come to mind. One is a, one was a story by Colette. It's only a one-page story called The Hand, uh, published in 1924, uh, nearly a century ago now, and uh, it's about a, uh, a young woman who marries a very young woman who marries a much older man. And what the, what what she does in the story is describe. They wake up in the morning, and she describes his hand, which takes on symbolic importance in the course of a page, a long page. And uh, it was I was teaching this story uh, about five years ago, and I had an Indian student. East Indian, uh, who I came around the office and was talking and, and got to know her, and she was about 19 or so, and uh, she was going home for Thanksgiving to be introduced to uh, her future husband, who she hadn't met, uh, who was about 37, 38, something like that, and uh, she was anxious about it, and but of course this is part of the tradition in her family, and she uh, really, really had was really ambivalent about it and 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 was gradually being increasingly americanized she was from mumbai uh in the in the space of 3 months while she was in the country and um she went home on thanksgiving met this guy and then we read colette uh in early december and after reading the story because what happens is that in the story that the hand becomes a, a kind of a, a, a paw a, a beast uh, uh, appendage, and she realizes the horror that she's gotten herself, the horrible situation she's gotten herself into. She came back, she read the story, and she went back after after the break and told her parents that she wasn't going to do it. And that was, and I got to hear this story at the beginning of the next semester. It changed her life. It actually changed her and, and then the other kinds of things that, there, there's a very famous story by Ernest Hemingway called Soldier's Home, published also well, in 1925, um, which is about the romantic expectations that people have about war versus the realities and so on. So it's about a veteran, uh, as are so many of Hemingway's stories, but a veteran returning from World War One, and uh, and it's, the title is so, again Soldier's Home, uh, and it's about his returning to a Midwestern town, which uh, is filled with uh, presumptions and assumptions about the war and why it was fought and how it was fought and so on. And what he what he realizes is that he doesn't fit in, and that he's a way to use a phrase from Hemingway. He's a way they'll never be. Um, and I've had veterans 
come back, I've been teaching a long time from a number of wars, actually, who have read that story and wept. Mm -hmm. I'm realizing I missed, maybe I missed the question, but I'm going to make a plug for a, a story by a Mexican-American writer named Tomas Rivera. It's called La Noche Buena. It's about a woman who has, um, oh, my God, I'm forgetting the name of the disease that uh, she has, but she can't leave her neighborhood. She gets, uh, oh, oh, my God, I forgot uh -huh. the name. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, and, and it, Christmas Eve, she she wants to get, get presents for her family. And... Um, but she is every block that she goes, she walks from her house. She gets a little more crazy, and um, until she ends up in a in a crest um, drugstore, and is absolutely stealing and doing everything wrong. And the story is very short, but it describes the community that is so insulated and so afraid to step out of itself to get beyond. The Across the railroad tracks, that uh, that that story itself, uh, I would recommend as a teacher, especially if you're teaching to Mexican American students, they'll get it instantly. They'll know that woman. It is every everybody has that person in their family. Hmm. That's great. Um, I think someone was suggesting that agoraphobia is the disease. <laughs> that yeah. is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, <laughs> that folk helped us understand that, and the name is La Noche Buena, La Noche Buena. La Noche Buena, yes. Um, and Dana Washington had a suggestion for engaging students. She put students into groups, each assigned to a different aspect of the piece, and uh, then they get to discuss it, but the students help teach the class, but they have a, the safety of their consistent group of peers. And I guess she has some great activities to get the groups to bond in the first place, but they feel very secure, and then they could go out and teach the literature to each other. Sounds like a great idea. Yeah, that's great. Oh. I, I should mention, by the way, that, that there is, uh, along with the anthology, a 550-page instructor's manual that has all kinds of suggestions uh, that are class-tested by users of the book uh, in addition to uh, uh, you know the, my my input and in, in, in the people who worked on the in, the instructor's manual, and uh, they seem they seem to work pretty well. Uh, not not for everyone, of course, but there's a variety of approaches that um, might be useful to people. Uh, Lois uh, Rubin asks, says, my students got angry with a character in a story and spoke out about all the things he did wrong. Do you think that's a good or a bad thing? I think it's a good thing. And I think it's a mistake to think that a, a character has, has, has to be or should be good. That's why it's fiction, so you can discuss exactly, so you can discuss what's wrong, what's right, and what you like about them. And sometimes it, you need to explore bad characters so you can understand what not to be or what, how a bad person goes bad. There's all kinds of different ways, but I, I, I absolutely think it's good that uh, – you know, it's one of the things you do in creative writing. Quit, quit making everybody perfect and part of your your mind. Uh, you know, you might be pushing an idea, but the be best way to push an idea is often by saying the worst possible things. So, yeah, I, I, think it's I, all good. I it's certainly, at the, at, I guess that the, the one of the foundations of of fiction is always conflict, and sometimes that conflict is between the character and the reader. Um, Linda Pilot wants to piggyback on this and say her students struggle with the concept of unreliable narrators. <laughs> well, we 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 all, um, you know, we, we struggle with that in life. That's for sure. That's <laughs> I was going to say, read the congressional record. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why it's even more reasonable to study them. <laughs> no, it is, but it is a it is a complicated. Proposition uh, because uh, for for relatively inexperienced readers it can be confusing, but I but I again if if you walk somebody through a, a text and give them a little bit of a heads up perhaps 
um, I, it's, it's not certainly insurmountable. And I would recommend certainly that uh, to start with that, you choose short pieces so that uh, the, the whatever incons inconsistencies are there, and you can certainly do with poems, narrative poems do this. Um, it, you can you can do it in in the short run as opposed to feeling like you've been duped after reading, you know, a play or a thirty page short story. Uh, it, it it it's a lesson that can be quickly learned as opposed to arduously learned. Right, that's great. Um, Linda follows up with saying it it makes it really exciting when they begin to recognize it. Um, I love that moment. <laughs> Um, I would say too, just uh, just a one last comment. It's it's sort of a another version of the mystery. It's the same thing that people read mystery novels and things like that. And it, it's sort of the puzzle aspect of reading fiction sometimes is to figure these other things out. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Um, well, unfortunately, that's about all the time we have for today, but um, we certainly want to thank you, Michael and Dagoberto, for such an engaging discussion. We want to thank all of you on the phone. Um, you all really uh, made this a, a wonderful discussion, so we, we really appreciate it. Um, again, this webinar um, will be archived. Um, I have the address up here at bedfordstmartins.com forward slash webinars. Um, we'll be sending out that link, and of course you can share that with your colleagues. Um, certainly this is an ongoing discussion about um, you know, engaging uh, literature students, and um, you know, we, we hope to follow up on this as well. But um, thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, Michael and Dagoberto. And, um, and that concludes our webinar for today. And thank you all for listening. Thank you. I appreciate it too. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.